Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. In December of 1965, a spacecraft called Gemini 6 was flying in outer space, looking back down at Earth. The crew members on board were on call with mission control when they announced the following alarming message. We have an object, looks like a satellite going from north to south, up in polar orbit. He's in a very low trajectory traveling from north to south and has a very high climbing ratio. It looks like it might even be a... mm, And then the audio cuts off. After a few more details, sleigh bells start to jingle, and the familiar tune, Jingle Bells, passed from Gemini 6 to Mission Control. With a harmonica and sleigh bells, Wally Shearer and Tom Stafford played the first live song from space, Jingle Bells. And yes, the astronauts were playing a joke on mission control. They were pretending to see Santa Claus. Let's listen to the live recording from the YouTube channel Bedford Brass Quintet. Uh, We have an object, looks like a satellite, uh, going from north to south, up in a polar orbit. Uh, He's in a very low trajectory, traveling from north to south. Uh, has a very high finest ratio. Looks like it might even be a uh, a bonus thing. Very low. Looks like maybe one three hundred percent. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, in today's lesson, which is part two of episode one thirty five. You're going to hear the story of the creator of Jingle Bells. You'll learn a little bit about his questionable character. And we'll also go through the lyrics so that you can sing to it in English if you want to. Jingle Bells is debatably one of the most popular songs in English. It's been rewritten and recorded thousands of times since its creation in the 1800s. The famous tune has even been translated into over 70 languages. So if you travel around the world, you may hear Cascabel in Spain, Viva Le Vent in France, and Ein kleiner weißer Schneemann in Germany. Yep, all of the songs are to the same tune. Christmas time in the States wouldn't be the same, of course, without jingle bells blasting from speakers around town. Some people hate it, others love it. How did it get so popular? Well, it all starts with a lyricist and composer named James Lord Pierpont. Pierpont came into the world in 1822 in Boston, Massachusetts. Pierpont was born into a forward-thinking, aristocratic family. His father was an abolitionist, a reverend in a local church, and a poet. So James Pierpont grew up in a musical environment. He learned to play the organ at church. He sang in the church choir and wrote songs. But he most definitely wasn't a typical church boy he didn't do exactly as his parents wished. Pierpont went to a boarding school, the type of school where students both live and are taught. Boarding schools have a reputation for being expensive, rigorous, in other words, very challenging, and competitive. Most boarding schools are on the East Coast, and today, only 35,000 kids go to them which is a small fraction of the almost 50 million who attend public school. James Pierpont went to a boarding school, but at the age of 14, he decided to run away and join the crew of a whaling ship. 
Whaling is an activity that involves hunting whales. It has a long history and a prominent one in New Bedford, Massachusetts, close to the area where James grew up. There was some sense of adventure in whaling. It was dangerous. You could spend years at sea. But it was also extremely profitable. Whale oil fueled the Industrial Revolution. It was used to lubricate machinery. Not only that, the oil was used to make smokeless and odorless candles which were highly desirable at that time. Before the young age of 21, Pierpont also joined the U.S. Navy. So by the time it hit 1845, he had spent seven years out at sea. In 1845, that's when he decided it was time to settle down. To settle down means to slow down and start to live a normal, steady life. People who settle down have predictable routines and oftentimes start a family. For Pierpont, that meant returning to Massachusetts, getting married. He married a woman named Millicent, and they had two children. The thing is, he was an adventurer at heart. So when news spread about the gold rush in California, he packed his bags and headed out west. We spoke about the gold rush in episode number nine. Rumor had it that in 1849, if you started digging for gold or panning for it in Northern California, you could become extremely rich. Unfortunately for Pierpont, he wasn't very lucky. Later, he documented his trials and tribulations in a musical number called The Returned Californian. According to him, people told him about the heaps of dust and lumps so mighty big, but they never said a single word how hard they were to dig. He ended up with nothing. Many other 49ers, the people who tried to get rich in California at that time, returned home with nothing less than broken dreams. James Pierpont was one of six children. He was also the uncle of a famous man you may know, John Pierpont Morgan, a.k.a. J.P. Morgan, the American financier and investment banker who went on to create J.P. Morgan & Company, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. So success ran in his blood, but before 1857, there was definitely no sign of success. He hopped around the U.S., trying out different professions. Most of his 30s were spent in Medford. He was sewing bosoms with his wife and taking care of his father's correspondence. So he was taking care of his father's correspondence, his mail. And a bosom, well, that's essentially an old-fashioned bra. It was a garment that women used in the past to cover their breasts. So James Pierpont was sewing bras, essentially. (laughs) In English, when someone is going through a period of their life that's characterized by misery or lack of success, and then when something worse happens on top of it all, we say that they've hit rock bottom. When you've hit rock bottom, you feel like things can't possibly get worse. And when you hit rock bottom, you can cry and sit around in self-loathing, or you can act to change things. Shortly after James's wife died in 1856, he moved to Savannah, Georgia, with his brother John Pierpont and he became the music director of a church there. He also played the organ and directed the choir. At a Sunday school concert for Thanksgiving, he played a composition to church visitors. It was called One Horse Open Sleigh, the original name for Jingle Bells. Oh, 
Don't go be a thing. Making fit and fright. What fun it is to ride and sing. A sling song. The audience loved it. The melodies were catchy, so catchy, he was asked to play it again at their Christmas show. One Horse Open Sleigh was a secular song. It wasn't about Bible stories or holy nights. It had nothing to do with Christmas. And it wouldn't until the early 20th century. It was simply about a playful ride through the snow on a sleigh. Sleigh, S-L-E-I-G-H, is a sled that is pulled by horses or reindeer through the snow. Santa Claus rides in a sleigh. If you travel to Medford, Massachusetts, they'll proudly tell you that James Lord Pierpont, the writer of Jingle Bells, was referring to their local sleigh races in the 1800s. That's what the song was about. Horses and sleighs at that time would wear lots of bells to warn other drivers of their arrival. The jingling bells would help prevent collisions. So it was a safety measure. Remember, Medford, Massachusetts was sort of James's home on and off from 1849 until 1857. It's where he left Millicent and his two kids to live with his father while he was away in California. And it's also where he returned after failing to get rich. It's where he made those bras. Today in Medford, Massachusetts, you'll see a sign in the center of the square that says, and I quote, Jingle Bells composed here. On this site stood the Simpson Tavern, where in 1850, James Pierpont wrote the song Jingle Bells in the presence of Mrs. Otis Waterman, who later verified the song was written here. Pierpont had the song copyrighted in 1857 while living in Georgia. Jingle Bells tells of the sleigh races held on Salem Street in the early 1800s. What's funny about this is that there is an ongoing battle about the specifics of where the song was written and whose town has claim to fame. If you travel to Savannah, Georgia, a plaque outside the church that James worked at lets visitors know that James Pierpont, the composer of Jingle Bells, was an organist there. When that sign was placed in 1985, the mayor at the time, Rusakis, claimed, quote, finally and formally, that Savannah, Georgia was the birthplace of Jingle Bells. This may seem like a trivial argument. Trivial meaning not important. But in the U.S., people care so much about origins. It gives a sense of local pride. It can attract more tourists. People are tied to histories, even if they're created and not true. People from the North laugh at the idea that Jingle Bells was created in the South. In fact, a reporter from the Boston Globe, Boston is in Massachusetts, uh, points out that the song doesn't say, dashing through the sun, through oaks and Spanish moss, sleigh riding's no fun, when there's no snow to cross. <laughs> um, excuse my singing voice. But he's poking fun at the South because it's just too hot to have inspired Jingle Bells. Georgia is known for Spanish moss. It's sort of this growth that it gets on their trees. It's really beautiful, but very itchy if you touch. And um, their sun, they have a lot of sun. So even if James Pierpont chose to be buried in Savannah, it just can't be a song of the South. The origin of Jingle Bells is a long, ongoing battle that is still discussed today. So where was Jingle Bells first performed? Was it in that church in Georgia? Or is there a different story, one that people don't like to share? More recent records discovered that the show was performed as early as September 15, 1857, at the Ordway Hall in Boston. And there is a chance 
that its performance was a minstrel one. Minstrel performances were theatrical performances that made fun of African Americans and slaves, with white performers painting their faces black. Could it be that Pierpont intended Jingle Bells to be a minstrel performance? Although there's no record of the nature of the original performance at Ordway Hall in 1857, the original sheet music from that year was dedicated to John P. Ordway. Ordway Hall was a minstrel hall. Minstrel songs and sleigh songs at that time were popular and profitable. We do know that those are two things that James Pierpont was after. We also know that Pierpont was pro-slavery. During the American Civil War, he joined the Confederacy and wrote songs to empower Confederate soldiers, such as We Conquer or Die and Strike for the South. In fact, he fought against his own father who was in the Union. His father was an abolitionist. He was against slavery. So was James Pierpont a family man? Doesn't seem like it. Is James Pierpont an admirable person? I can guess that by this point, most of you are thinking not really. I digress. Jingle Bells was published in 1857 under the name One Horse Open Sleigh. After about two years, the sheet music was reprinted under the name Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells wasn't immediately famous, but by the early 1890s, it was a popular tune. From 1890 to 1954, Jingle Bells was the most recorded song in the United States. Let's listen to a recording of it from 1898. Isn't it surprising how good that recording is? I mean, the quality of the sound? It's wild. One of the most recognizable versions today was released by Bing Crosby and the Andrews Sisters in 1945. That version has stood the test of times. To stand the test of times means to remain popular as time passes. Jingle Bells by Bing Crosby and the Andrew Sisters has stood the test of times. It's still popular even today. So James Pierpont, like his nephew, J.P. Morgan, found his success. But he didn't see a lot of it because he died in 1893. Today, Pierpont is what we call a one-hit wonder. A one-hit wonder is a band, artist, or composer who has one song, and only one song, that blows up. It goes viral. People love it. It's a hit. Did he have other music? Sure. He never stopped writing, and his styles varied over time. Only one of them made it real big. Jingle Bells was so successful that James was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1970. Let's go ahead and go through the lyrics of the song. Starting with the first verse. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleighing song tonight. All right, so the first two lines, dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. To dash means to move quickly, in a hurry. In track and field, a runner might take part in the 100-yard dash, which is a race of 100 yards, or 300 feet. It's a sprint. In other words, it's a very fast race. My mom might dash to the store to get 
an ingredient that she forgot to make a recipe. Right? So if they are dashing through the snow, they're moving quickly. Maybe they're racing. Maybe they're in a rush to get somewhere. We don't know. We do know that they are in a one-horse open sleigh. A sleigh is a vehicle that can travel on snow and even on flat ground because it's pulled by an animal, a reindeer, a horse. Here, it's pulled by one horse, and we know it's open. The sleigh is open. It's not enclosed or covered. Or the fields we go laughing all the way. Or, um, I'm laughing because it's a contraction of over, and it's a contraction that I've never heard in any other situation other than in this song. Over the fields we go is what he's saying. And I believe he chose to use it because it fit well in the song. So they're going over the fields. A field is an open area of land. As they move along, they're laughing. They're laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a slaying song tonight. A bobtail is an old-fashioned term used to refer to the tail on a horse or dog. In this song, it's on a horse. So the bells are jingling or ringing as they ride. And as I mentioned previously, these bells were used to prevent collisions. You could hear when someone was coming close. So bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. This means that the bells are lightening the mood. They are making people happy. What fun it is to ride and sing a slaying song tonight. Right, this is fairly explanatory. It's so fun. It's so exciting to sit in a sleigh and sing a sleigh song while being in it. So that's pretty fun. The chorus is simple. Let's go through it. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. This is fairly easy, but what's interesting is that jingle is in the imperative. The imperative is a mood in English used to give orders or commands. For example, I could tell you, hey, go get the newspaper from the porch. Stop talking. Do your homework. Right? These are imperatives. They're commands. And jingle is in the imperative. So someone is telling the bells to jingle, right? Jingle bells, make your noise. Make that sound ring. Anyway, as I said, the next part of the course is easy. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Once again, it's exciting to ride in an open sleigh, an uncovered sleigh, with one horse pulling it. Before we move on to the second verse, it's important to note that in the 1800s, riding in sleighs was serious business in the northern part of the United States, in areas where it snowed. Sleighs were the method of transportation. And they were also used for sport and leisure. Sleigh races were big events where people would hang out, drink, talk, watch the competition. It was also where men would pick up on girls. So think of Fast and the Furious, but in the 1800s. And not with fast cars, but with sleighs and snow. Let's move to verse 2. A day or two ago, I thought I'd take a ride. And soon Miss Fanny Bright was seated by my side. The horse was lean and lank. Misfortune seemed his lot. He got into a drifted bank and then we got upsought. So let's go through line by line. A day or two ago, I thought I'd take a ride. And soon Miss Fanny Bright was seated by my side. So a few days ago, maybe yesterday, maybe the day before yesterday, he thought he'd take a ride. 
And soon there was a lady at his side and her name was Miss Fanny Bright, which is kind of a fun name. It sounds a little old fashioned. There are a bunch of theories about who Miss Fanny Bright is, but really nobody knows. She's about the same as Parson Brown from the classic Christmas song, Winter Wonderland. Everyone knows their names. Everyone sings their names in Christmas songs, and nobody knows who they are. So she's just seated by his side. She's sitting next to him. It's also important to note Miss Fanny Bright. So she's single. It's not a Mrs. So there's that. (laughs) The horse was lean and lank. Misfortune seemed his lot. He got into a drifted bank, and then we got upsought. The horse was lean and lank. So lean and lank are two interesting adjectives. Lean means without fat. You can go to the grocery store and buy lean meat. So it's not very fatty. The horse is lean. And lank. Lank comes from lanky. Imagine a 16 or 17-year-old boy who just went through a growth spurt, he's probably a little lanky. He's long and thin, and that's the description of this horse. It's long and thin. Misfortune seemed his lot, so he was destined to be unlucky. He got into a drifted bank, and then we got upsought. Now, I'm from California, and when I hear drifted bank, I immediately think of a river bank. A bank is a sort of shore or a beach next to a river. Uh, It's where you would sit if you don't want to be wet. So you're in the sand or you're in the dirt right next to the water. And a drifted bank, I just imagine it to be moving with water. But the horse didn't get stuck in drifting water or moving water. He actually got stuck in a snowbank. A snowbank is a pile of snow. So if you're driving up to the mountains, you might see a snowbank on the side of the road, right next to where the street is. He got into a drifted bank, and then we got upsought. Some people believe that upsought means overturned or turned over. So the horse flipped upside down, the sleigh flipped upside down. But it looks like, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, he invented this word. He changed upset to upsought because it rhymed with lot. So this isn't actually a word, um, but you get the idea that, that the sleigh tipped over. Then we get to the chorus again, and then verse 3. Listen to this. A day or two ago... The story I must tell, I went out on the snow, and on my back I fell. A gent was riding by in a one-horse open sleigh. He laughed as there I sprawling lie, but quickly drove away. Let's go through it line by line. A day or two ago, the story I must tell. So he has to tell a story, a story of something that occurred yesterday or the day before yesterday. He went out on the snow, and on my back I fell. He fell on his back. A gent was riding by. So a gent is a gentleman. You can equally say gent or gentleman. They're the same thing. And this gent was in a one-horse open sleigh. He laughed as there I sprawling lie. Right? So he's on the ground, lying down with his legs and arms extended sprawled out. Clearly, he seems hurt. So this guy doesn't really sound like a gentleman after all. Once again, we hear the chorus, and then we're on to verse 4, the last verse of all of them. Now the ground is white, go it while you're young. Take the girls tonight and sing this slaying song. Just get a bobtailed bay, 240 as his speed, Hitch him to an open sleigh and crack, you'll take the lead. Now the ground is white. Go it while you're young. Right? The ground is white. It's covered in snow. 
Get out there while you're young. Take the girls tonight and sing this slaying song. So bring some girls on your sleigh and sing this song. Just get a bobtailed bay. A bobtailed bay is a brown horse with a short tail. 240 as his speed. This means that the horse is traveling 22.5 miles per hour or 2 minutes and 40 seconds per mile. Hitch him to an open sleigh and crack, you'll take the lead. Hitch means to connect to. So when someone gets hitched, it means they get married. Two people are connected together. You can hitch a trailer to a truck, it means to connect it, or hitch a bobtailed bay to a sleigh, right? To an open sleigh, potentially a sleigh that is not being used. And crack, you'll take the lead. Crack is the sound that a whip makes when it's hit. Right, so this sounds like a race. And if you take the lead, it means you get to the front. Get to the front of the pack. Once again, you'll hear the chorus, and that's the end of the song. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn about other songs, check out episode number 15 which is about the birth of the happy birthday song, and episode number 130, which is about a song called Sunday Toasted. It paints a very nice visual of a typical summer's day in the South and also introduces cool American slang. Hope you're having a nice day, and until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon. Jingle bells, Batman smells, Robin lays an egg. Batmobile broke his wheel and Joker got away. Hey!